from worms to overcooked to moving out and so much more. Our next guest has helped shape the global landscape of indie games for three decades. Debbie Bestwick from Team 17 sat down to give us an inside look at her career. Let's take a look. Hello there, Play NYC. Uh, this is Dan from Playcrafting. Super, super excited to present this next conversation. Uh, joining me today is Debbie Bestwick. Debbie is the CEO of the award-winning veteran games developer and international games label, Team 17. Debbie joined the games industry at the age of 17, starting out in indie retailing, where she won Indie Retailer of the Year at just 18 years old. She then co-founded Team 17 in 1990 at the age of 20. And for those of you who don't know, which I'm, I don't think there's too many of you, uh, Team 17 is a leading international games label with award-winning franchises, including The Escapist, Overcooked, Ukulele, Worms, and many more titles from developers around the world. Most recently, two critically acclaimed titles, Blasphemous and Ukulele and The Impossible Layer, join an impressive roster of over 100 games released by Team 17 across PC, console, and mobile platforms over the past 30 years. Debbie, so, so happy to have you joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. You're just reminding me, though, <clears throat> I must be getting old. 30 years, right? That feels like forever. <laughs> well, especially when we're in a, t a time zone here where it's like two months feels like 15 years. I'm sure 30 years feels like about 400 centuries at this point. Totally agree. I keep saying, you know, you wake up, you start work on a Monday, and by Monday evening it feels like a Friday, and on a Friday it starts to feel like a Monday. The whole world, the whole week just blurs now. There is no day of the week. It's just, you know, it's not working from home. It's actually living with your work if you're like I am, which is incredibly passionate about games. Yeah, amen to that. And I'm sure you can agree that, you know, for those of us that have been living, working, playing in virtual spaces for all this time. Uh, it's, 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 you know, bittersweet, but also a really uh, exciting time to see so many people diving into virtual worlds that I don't think were there before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I'm in lockdown with my 11 year old son, you know, he's not been in school since the beginning of March. Um, so where does he get his social interaction? How does he mix with his friends? You know, he's doing that through gaming right now. Yeah. You know, we like to call games the great uniter because they can unite folks from all different backgrounds, all different places. And even now with Plan I see this year going virtual, you know, without us being online, we may not have been able to connect at a live show uh, for this year. So I I'm super grateful that you're able to join us for this year's Plan YC. No, it's a privilege and thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, let's talk about all the way back in the beginning. Let's go back 30 years ago. Uh, why don't you give folks uh, an introduction to how you got your start in games and where you're coming from right, right, right from the beginning? Absolutely. Um, I take it way back further than 30 years. Um, I think the first ever type of computer game, video game that I ever played um, was Pac-Man. I think I must have been about four or five. Um, and then I moved on to Space Invaders, um, I think when I was about seven. Um, but when I truly realized um, that gaming was something that I wanted to be a part of, I was 12 years old. I was playing um, an 8-bit Spectrum um, you know, we had the really poor version. I come, you know, I didn't come from a wealthy background. Um, and I was playing a game called Football Manager. And I used to save up my pocket money to buy computer magazines, to enter the cheat codes and get totally involved in it. And I think I was 12 when I realized um, the games industry wasn't really the games industry. It was a new form of entertainment at that time. But it, you could see already it was something that was so interactive, you know, and it brought a different kind of emotional connection from you as a consumer, um, but also a form of escapism as well compared to film and music. And so I was 12 when I really realized this was something that was gonna play a part of my life. Um, I did the usual thing studied at school. Um, I went on to further education, um, which was supposed to be two years, um, which over here in the UK was um, our A-levels. Uh, I did one year 
and uh, I was offered a job in a video in a computer game shop um, which was an independent store in the middle of Nottingham in the Midlands where I come from and I quit my education I am not condoning that by the way I'm just saying it worked out <laughs> fine for me um, but I just turned I think I, I wasn't quite 17 um, and I went to work in a retail environment and to be totally honest, I couldn't believe somebody was going to pay me to play video games all day. Um, I'm sure I was meant to sell games and I did a good job of that too. Um, but it seemed like an absolute dream move to a teenager to go into gaming, you know, in a, at the very, I mean, we're talking the mid eighties here. Um, so it was a, a very, very early industry and honestly, it was a dream come true just to enter into video games in the first place and i've never looked back never looked back at all i love it wow and, and you know a lot of folks that get their start in the in the games industry start as fans start as players uh just like you um how did you sort of make that leap from uh you know working on the retail side all the way to team 17. yeah i think um <laughs> Like I said, I joined an independent retail um, and the people who owned that store, um, it was just a hobbyist game shop, as you can imagine back then. And um, they had full time jobs and, you know, they offered me the manager's job within a few months and I took the manager's job and it became very clear to me that they saw it more as a it was a business um but it wasn't really going anywhere and so they shared with me that they were looking for somebody to buy the business and take over and so i found them a buyer um and it was a larger retail chain here in the uk called microbyte and you know the founder of microbyte um he had a couple of businesses the other one was 17-bit software which was a shareware company um where we released public domain and I think within a couple of years, he actually asked myself and Martin Brown if we wanted to move over to look at forming and building um, a games company, a games publishing company. It, at that point, his view was, well, with the shareware company, we have access to all this incredible talent all over Europe and in North America. And actually, we also have our own retail outlets where we can sell these games through. It's very bizarre, but it's a bit like having your own app store back in the 80s um, where you could sell your content through. Um, and so, you know, I was 19, um, jumped at the opportunity because, you know, this has been a co-founder of a business. Um, we were minority shareholders, myself and Martin, you know, the, that's the point where I realized the people with the money get the biggest line share of the shares because they're funding the, you know, <clears throat> um, funding the company. Um, but yeah, we were incredibly young, very, very young. Um, but we also came from um, different backgrounds with a huge amount of knowledge as well. You know, I'd done a few years in retail at that point. I understood consumer trends. Um, I knew what was popular, what wasn't popular. And also we had access to, like I say, a huge amount of talent all over Europe that were actually making incredible demos to show off the hardware, in particular for the home computer, the Amiga market. Wow. And tell us about some of those uh, those earliest titles and in, in like the first twelve months uh, of the company. Um, what what were some of those? And, and dive in a little bit more there. Sure. Um, the first game um, was a game called Full Contact, um, and everybody always asks, "Why did you go with a beat 'em up?" Well. Uh, you know, a few of us were huge fans of IK Plus. Um, it sold really well, right? Um, we were also playing Street Fighter in the arcades as well. And, you know, um, we knew it was in a genre where those games traditionally sold well. Um, but we, we were looking to do something quite different. So our thought process was, how do we announce ourselves? Um, you know, we didn't think globally at that point, we were thinking very UK. Um, how do we make sure that we get our games in, you know, bigger stores, you know, like the chain stores and the supermarkets. Um, and so what we did, we basically made what we would call a full price game back then. Um, and launched it at a budget price point. And that game um, immediately went to number one. Um, so we landed, we'd announced ourselves, um, and that was a huge success. And, and then obviously we moved on to games like Alien Breed and Project X and Super Frog. 
And I always say, our games were really hard, you know, they were really difficult. And people say, you know, your games were really, really difficult. Well, no surprise, right? We didn't have QA. There was, you know, three of us. Um, you know, I always say to people often say to me, do you know how well Alien Breed sold back in those days? And I go, I don't know exactly how many it sold, you know, because not only did we make the game and have to do the QA with a very tiny group, and I'm not talking, you know, 10 people here, I'm talking like five people. Um, but, you know, not only did we have to make the game, <clears throat> we'd have to QA it to the best of our abilities, um, but also we had to physically manufacture these games and ship them out as well. And, you know, I would say Alien Breed sold half a million units and they're like, how do you know that so specifically? And I'll tell you how we knew it because when we finished making the game, we had to go in the warehouse and pack them up wow. and ship them out to the distribution company. You know, we didn't have people that packed them for you. You had all the different components arrive in your warehouse and you had to build the physical goods up. So when I when I say to India's today, trust me, you know, I know some of it's harder today, but honestly, it was a lot more difficult back in those days. Yeah, I bet, you know, as you see online stores and, and sort of the digital distribution model, I bet it reminds you back then of sort of that, uh, that assembly line of having to, you know, ship out these physical copies. I'm sure it brings a lot of perspective. Oh, it totally reminds you, you know, and it's not, you know, it wasn't just building them up. You had to sell them into distribution companies and retail outlets and even just handling Europe. You know, the Amiga wasn't that huge over in America. It was predominantly more so over here in Europe, um, you know, and, just remember, you know, we weren't part of the EU, so all the extra documentation, you know, that had to be filled in and selling them. Um, you know, I always say we basically started work at seven o'clock in the morning and we'd often finish at least, you know, midnight, most nights, but that's what being a startup was back in those days. Right, right. So talk about the success of Worms, obviously, you know, internationally known franchise. Uh, a lot of folks like myself grew up on the Worms franchise. Um, you know, it, it seems like that sort of was a, a turning point or maybe a like a leveling up uh, for Team 17 and for your work. Talk to us about how uh, Worms sort of evolved in, and how it came into uh, the Team 17 family and, and what that meant for you. Sure. No. If you think of um, events like PAX in the early days where they were quite small consumer events, over here we had um, a trade event and it was called ECTS. Um, <clears throat> and I think at the point that Worms came in, Team 17 had around 52% market share in the UK of the Amiga market. And we just won joint publisher of the year with Electronic Arts. Um, you know, we'd launched 30 games prior to Worms. And, you know, just about every title and landed somewhere in the top five chart positions to give you an idea. And so we were fairly high profile. And so we went to this event and, you know, to this day, it feels like it was yesterday. And this kid, you know, he was only about 17, 18, walked up to us and we'd got our booth all set up, ready to go. And he came over and he said, look, I'm a huge fan of you, you guys. I'd love you to look at my game. We put this game on and we were looking at it and to be totally honest, to look at it, it's not really a lot to look at, right? I think we all accept visually Worms was not some shining example of pushing pixels, right? right, um, right. And, but what it was, um, was incredible gameplay. And, you know, that stuck with many of us all throughout our careers of the importance of gameplay, you know, and I think at the time at that event, you know, there was a game that everybody was talking about and it was called Rise of the Robots and it was these great big visuals and here we were with this game that, you know, you could hardly see the worm characters on the screen. Um, and we were playing the game um, as we were evaluating it and Andy, who was the creator, passed over his details and we said, look, we'd love to meet up with you and love to take this forward. That night after the show, we were all sat playing this game in the pub, like you do, you know. Um, and we asked um, one of the guys, have you got his contact details? And he'd actually lost them. So we nearly lost ones. Um, wow. And we... Yeah, we had to reach out to some friends of ours, uh, Amiga Format, uh, future publishing magazine over here. They'd run a competition um, 
for some, you know, basically indie Amiga games. And the game didn't win, but they had his contact details and we'd managed to, so we got back in touch with Andy. Um, and what Andy had brought to us was um, a game that was pure gameplay, pure gameplay, but without any polish. Um, and it needed a team put in around him to take it up another level to bring higher production values um, and also to bring the game to as many platforms as possible. We were firm believers, you know, the minute we picked it up, we were hooked. And it was obvious this was a game that you just needed to get into people's hands. If you could get the game into people's hands, they would absolutely fall in love with it. Um, and so it moved quite swiftly um, from signing the game Andy moved, um, he, le he, he lived in a place called Bournemouth down in the UK. He moved up to Wakefield in West Yorkshire, you know, um, and worked with a core team who actually rewrote the game from Blitz Basic into C++ to take it over on PC and consoles. And to be totally honest, the next six months was absolutely crazy. Um, a small team, you know, I, I'm so not a fan of crunch. I always say we only did crunch once in our lives. And to say that after 30 plus years, I think that's, you know, remarkable. Um, but we did do it on worms and it, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. Um, we took the game um, from one platform over to 10 platforms in six months. And, you know, we were all pretty exhausted by the end of that year. Um, but the game launched huge success, like you say. Um, I mean, today it sold over 75 million copies. And, you know, but I can honestly say it was quite a challenge to achieve what we tried to achieve as a small group of people in a very short time. Yeah, so, so fascinating too, to hear you know, how you could see sort of the potential for worms in those early days, even when, you know, the graphics weren't, you know, the flashiest, the most advanced. Um, what do you think is the recipe for a great video game at its core? Look, I say this to everybody all the time. Absolutely nothing is more important than gameplay, right? That's ingredient number one. Gameplay, absolutely crucial. Um, you know, if you were sitting there to write a recipe for it, you know, find a subject that you're passionate about. And I mean passionate about. This is not just something that you find fun for four or five hours a day. You're going to live this world for potentially two to three years. So make sure it's something that you're really, really passionate about as a subject matter. Um, you know, equally, if you're looking um, at your audience, like what we knew with Worms um, when we first saw it, Gameplay absolutely ticked those boxes. We also knew this was a game that anybody could play. It didn't matter what age group you were in. It was a game that anybody could pick up and play. So we knew the audience that we were aiming to reach. You know, so again, make sure that you understand your audience. Um, you know, if you're going into a crowded genre, you know, and I think that's one of the hard things today. There's never been more games being made than we see right now ever in our lifetimes. You know, um, finding a game within a genre that has a unique angle is incredibly difficult. So thinking about what you're doing different within a genre, I always look at two games that we launched last year, um, one being Hell Let Loose um, and the other one being Blasphemous. And people are like, what was so unique about them? In Hell Let Loose, it's one of the most realistic World War II simulator, simulation games, um, even down to the you know, the buttons on the coats, it is so realistic, more realistic than any other game in that genre. And when we looked at Blasphemous, there's a huge amount of Metroidvania games out there. What made Blasphemous unique and different? Its art style was just superb, absolutely superb, high production values, but also the topic, the story behind it was incredibly unique, you know, and the Game Kitchen, they're based in Seville, and it was very much based around a culture that they had grown up into. Uh, so they had that passion as well. Um, so I think, you know, like I say, gameplay is really important, passion for the subject matter, know your audience, look for a unique twist within a genre. And honestly, I cannot stress enough the importance of researching your subject. Just remember, you're making a game. If you're, look, there's nothing wrong making a game just as a hobby. 
<clears throat> you know, and you, everybody has different levels of what they think success is, you know. Um, but if you're making a game that you are looking to be commercially successful and hopefully help you build a sustainable studio, make sure you do your research. You know, we do a huge amount of research for every game that joins our label. And I think that's a really important area. Wow. Very, very helpful. Um, you know, you mentioned how uh, the, your introduction even to Worms was a 17 year old coming up to you at an event. Um, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, uh, there are more games being made than ever before now. Uh, what do you see as the biggest difference uh, in the indie game scene now versus back then? Yeah, um, I think in some ways um, it's actually easier, right? Um, and I know for any indie developer listening to this, they're going, are you joking? It's really tough, right? Um, let's just remember some corporate things that have happened in the last decade and a half. First of all, we have middleware now, Unity Engine, Unreal Engine. That makes it really easy for anybody to create a game. You know, I always look at games like Overcooked, which is made in the Unity Engine. Now go back to the early 90s. Could they have created that kind of game as a two person team? Absolutely not possible. They would have had to have developed a game engine. Right, so in some ways that is easier. Um, digital distribution, whether you want to work with a publisher, a games label or self publish. These days, the platforms are fairly open for you. Not only do you have, you know, Steam, Epic, um, but our games and many others, but on the console side, you can take your games onto Nintendo platforms. You can take them onto PlayStation. You can take them onto Xbox. Just remember for indie developers back in the early nineties, we couldn't do that. You know, we weren't allowed to self-publish any of our games. Um, we, ha we, you know, up until, I'm trying to think when it was where it changed, I think about 2011, um, <clears throat> we couldn't actually physically self-publish, even Team 17 couldn't self-publish their games on Xbox, you know, uh, or on PlayStation. The only way that you could do it was if you also took your games into retail, which took huge commitment. To give you an idea, you know, I think when we were looking at Worms in around 95, when we were launching, um, the inventory costs alone for the stock that needed to be built was close to 20 million. Right, never mind creating the game or the marketing. <clears throat> so in some ways, honestly, it's much easier today, um, but in other ways, it's much harder too. Discoverability is really tough, right? Um, and for years, we've talked about discoverability on the App Store and on Google Store, but for the last, probably since about 2014, discoverability has been much, much harder on PC and console stores as well. And that's why when we talk about <clears throat> those ingredients to make a successful game, things like that unique hook, you know, are really important. But equally today it's direct to consumer. So you can build an audience um, by Discord, you can build your audience by Reddit, you know, um, <clears throat> we also couldn't do that back in the day. So like I say, in some ways, it's easier, but equally discoverability. I think, you know, over 9,000 games um, launched on Steam last year and the year before that. Back in the 90s, you probably saw a couple of hundred games launched a year. All right. All right. Well, you know, you've mentioned a, a few more games that, uh, that you and Team 17 have touched and obviously, like, not little known, very, very well known games. Uh, I feel like we go into the Team 17 catalog and it's like a greatest hits of indie games, uh, even as recently as the past uh, year or two with Overcooked, Blasphemous, and, and so many more. Um, are there any titles that you passed up on at Team 17 that you, looking back now, regret on passing up on or missing out on? Do you know what? Um, I get asked this question all the time. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's a game that we've passed up on that I've seen go into like the top 20 uh, in the chart. So from a success point of view, no, I think um, there's been games where I've tried to persuade somebody to work with us, where they've chosen to go it alone that I look at. Um, 
<clears throat> I desperately wanted to accompany Gink in 2014, as an example, you know. Um, but I think the closest, uh, and it's a great story, the closest we ever come to passing up on a game is actually a game that we look after today and have looked after since 2016, um, Overcooked. Overcooked, oh, wow. um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll just share with you, um, Ollie and Phil, um, behind Ghost Town Games, um, they approached us in September 2015. Now, in July 2015, we announced our partnership um, with Platonic on ukulele, which had just completed a huge Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, we were just building our commercial team. So we were still only, at that time, we were only around five or six people in the commercial team. Um, and in the studio, I think we were about 80 people. So we didn't have the resources that we have today. And one of the things that I'd said when we were building a games label was, and we were gonna build something very different um, that was gonna be very much focused on helping development studios. And they were gonna get our time and attention. It wasn't just gonna be about when's the game launching and taking it to market. It was gonna be about helping them create the game but also sharing knowledge with them to help them build sustainable studios. So it meant that we could only handle a few games at any one time back then. Um, and so Overcut came into us in September, 2015. We played it, we loved it, we wanted to sign it. Our resources wouldn't allow us to sign it and it would break the rules that we had. Um, and so we declined it. And it was only, I think it was around April the following year I was talking to Gavin, who runs the Playtonic, and uh, ukulele was due out in October that year. And I was saying to Gavin, look, the one thing about being a game developer, you know when a game's gonna, whether a game's gonna make it or not in terms of release dates, right? That's what happens when you work on hundreds of games. Um, and you can identify problems even before development partners can. And Gavin was like, no, we think we can do it. And I said, look, Gavin, there's no pressure. We'll give you extra funding. Let's make sure you get this game right. You know, it's your first game out as Playtonic. And he said, are you sure, you know, that's not what publishers do? And I said, well, our jobs are to make sure that you create the best possible game that you can do and help you become sustainable on that path. And so we'd agreed that um, we would give Gavin and Playtonic some extra funding and they would move the game into the following year, which meant that I could handle another game that year. Um, and so I reached back out to Ollie and Phil and I said, look guys, um, have you found a publisher? How is it going? You know, we freed up, it, you know, we've got some resources, looks like that we can help you now. Um, and they said, look, Debbie, we're due to sign with somebody tonight. And I was like, oh gosh, you know. Um, and I said, look, I don't want to tread on any toes. You, we said no in September, we have to respect that. And they turned around and just said, look, can we think about this for a bit? And I went, sure. And they contacted me a few hours later and they were based in Cambridge and I'm based in the Midlands in the UK. We're about an hour and a half car drive away from each other at this point. Mm -hmm. And they said, can we just come over and spend some time with you tomorrow and talk through your thoughts, your plans, your ideas, and let's see where that leads. And we'll hold back on signing with whoever. And I still, I've never asked them to this day who was due to sign it, you know. Um, they came over the next day and I sat them down and I took them through the benchmarking that we do for every game that joins our label, which is where we do a huge amount of research in terms of, you know, other games within a genre, best case, potential, medium case, worst case, and talk them through the positioning of how we saw that they could position it and different things. And they turned around and just said, look, we'd love to work with you. And I think about the contract took us a few weeks to lock down with the lawyers. And I think they signed the contract literally two days before they flew, um, flew out to E3 and we announced the game. Wow. But that was so close, you know, and, you know, I always say, you know, and honestly, nothing to do with the game quality. Um, it was simply down to the fact, you know, we'd made a promise to ourselves when we started this that our time was going to be made available for our partners to help them 
Um, and sometimes that means that you can't handle as many things as what you'd like to. You know, we're in a very different position today compared to where we were in 2015. You know, we've done a lot of fundraising and, you know, our IPO has given us a lot more resources than most people have access to. Um, but yeah, the game that so nearly did not land on our label, which thankfully, and I'm blessed it is. Wow. Wow. Um, it's so interesting to hear how like things could have gone differently. <laughs> um, and you know, uh, there's so much great stuff that you're saying here about the do's and don'ts uh, for indie developers, indie studios, uh, and how they can get discovered and, and how they can sustain. And I, and I wanted to really, you know, dig in a little bit with you around sustainability. Uh, you said before that sustainability is fundamental to creativity when it comes to indie games. Uh, and it's, it seems to me like this is something that many indie developers and studios are really struggling uh, to learn. You know, uh, this is a very passionate industry. This is um, an industry uh, and a craft and a medium that is very much born of being a fan of games to start. And so a lot of folks come into making their own games and wanting to make sort of their dream game and like the, the most outside the box, craziest, coolest idea that they can. But sometimes it can come at the expense of, you know, having a s sustainable, um, you know, timeline and, and budget so that this can actually be something that they can do on a regular basis and build a real business out of it. Um, what, what advice would you give indies who are trying to find that right balance between keeping the lights on while also fulfilling themselves through their art and through their craft? Yeah. I think why we talk about sustainability so much is, you know, we like to remind you know, all developers, don't forget, we we are one of you. We lived in that same world um, for two decades, two and a half decades before I would say Team 17 became fully sustainable. Um, sustainability for me is, um, it allows you to create exactly what you want to create without being beholden to anybody. And it allows you to focus on, in my opinion, when you take money worries away from people in, and it, this is not just relevant to independents and indies, this is actually relevant to many studios in development. I believe every developer on the planet has a dream of sustainability. I know we did for a long time. Um, but it's, you know, you can create your best work. Um, but when you take away those worries of payroll, you know, the rent, you know, and let's not, let's not forget Indies as well. They're trying to put food on the table for their families often at home. You know, they may be working a job or their wife may be working a job and, you know, their co-team together. Um, this is pretty rough, you know, to get to sustainable levels. And so, the advice that I give everybody is, you know, really, really, really think hard about this. Um, look ahead. If you, you know, talk to companies like ourselves and many other games labels and get a partner on board to help with that funding, don't ever go and remortgage your house. Sorry, don't do that. That's wrong. You know, don't go and borrow money from family and friends because when you can't repay them back, they're not going to be your, that. they're not going to love you as much as what they did before, right? right. So... You know, there's some infinite wisdom in using other people's money sometimes. And yes, you have to give up a little bit sometimes. But trust me, when you get to a certain scale, the cake gets much bigger. So you're given a slice, but of a much bigger cake in terms of the revenue potential. Too many people get hung up on giving a percentage away in the early stages when, when you consider everything that's around it and the reach that they can take you to. Many games on our label have sold multi million units. You know, we've helped so many. Um, independent studios in the last six years, you know, that aren't just sustainable for the next decade, but they're sustainable for two and three decades now, you know, and multimillionaires, um, they all gave up a slice of that cake to get help, to get moving, um, and it came back. But, you know, I do, there's, I think the hardest thing with sustainability, when you say to people, look, then if you're releasing a game, it, you may become sustainable overnight, but you should never assume that. You know, sustainability can take three, can take five games sometimes, where you've got regular revenue streams coming in that support your business. Um, so like in any business, be very practical. Don't carry overheads unless you need to carry those overheads. I've, I've met many independent teams, you know, and they will tell me that they've got a community manager, 
you know, they've got a HR person and yet they've got no programmers. I mean, come on, think about what is absolutely crucial to getting you along that journey. And so think very smartly about that. Um, the, a lot of this is the advice that we give people, you know, and, and support that we give. When I said about building a games label, it was only because I wanted to open up all of our development resources. So if you think of yourself being an indie development team and you're doing network play on your indie game, what's a, what's an experienced network coder going to cost you? You know, you're in New York, so it's going to cost more than it is going to cost in the North of England, but equally not a million miles apart. An indie, de indie developer can't afford that person on payroll. Um, so they either have to contract them and give them a share of their royalties or they partner with somebody like ourselves who actually gives them those network programmers and helps them become sustainable much quicker. Um, but sustainability is hard work. Don't, there is no two ways about it. It is genuine hard work. It's keeping your feet on the ground, even when you are successful. I've seen many teams immediately go out there and hire 20 people. All of a sudden, they become a 30, 35 person indie team, you know, and game one, all the profits from game one are actually paying payroll. And then, you know, if game two is not a success, they're out of business. Think about how you manage funding and be practical about this. Such great advice, uh, especially given the economic times that we're in right now. Uh, and specifically for, and I know you called out um, developers in and around New York City. Um, I, something I love about, you know, the, the way you're approaching, uh, you know, sort of mentorship around uh, indie studios and indie developers, you are very, you have very much like a, a New York sort of uh, attitude about you. And it's so refreshing and wonderful because uh, we as New Yorkers, we have sort of this can't stop, won't stop mentality. Uh, but, you know, we really appreciate blunt, realistic advice that really takes into account the struggles and the challenges and whatnot. And I think, you know, uh, when folks see sort of breakout indie successes, like let's use like Flappy Bird as an example, there's a reason why those are newsmakers, uh, because they are outside of the norm. Um, and so it's really helpful to hear, you know, your years of experience and how that really can help uh, shape the future of indie studios and, and indie developers. Um, you know, given the unprecedented times that we're in now uh, with COVID-19, with protests against racial inequality and injustice, um, at the same time, we're, we're, we're seeing sort of more and more people going to games as a source of escapism, um, as a source of entertainment, uh, connection, et cetera. Uh, what do you think is the future of games and, and how uh, can games as an industry, as an art, as a medium, really meet this moment that we're in now, uh, considering that this is sort of a, a world changing period that we're in at the moment? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. Um, last week I was doing um, some investor calls and a very similar question came up. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, when we talk, when we as a game as games developers and we talk about online play or we talk about user generated content most of us have been living in this world for the last two decades right you know i think worms 2 was online in 1997 and think about the first ever online game that you played you know and we had user generated content in the 90s i think the current climate, you know, more than ever is showing the strength and the importance of online gaming now and multiplayer, you know, I believe games have always brought people together, um, you know, especially multiplayer ones like Overcooked Worms, The Escapist and many other games on our label. But I also feel that games have always been very inclusive. You know, they're a hobby that everyone can take part in regardless of the differences between people. You know, um, and that includes, you know, ability, ethnicity, you know, games don't really discriminate, you know, well, other than people on skill level. As a good example, my son has absolutely battered me on Fortnite over the last few months. I'm not as fast to react as what I used to be in the 90s, um, but they're very active and it's a very constructive way to spend time. I think more than other, I made the point, you know, I sit on Creative Industries Council here in the UK and I talked about the importance of the internet that we all take for granted. You know, can you imagine what the last five months would have been like without internet access? Right, you right. Know? 
right? It's almost now an essential uh, in the same way that, you know, electricity and water is, right? Um, and so the importance of improving our network infrastructures just around the globe for everybody, you know, everybody should have access to the internet. This is really important. Um, but I do believe games going forward are just going to be far more inclusive. I don't believe that they do discriminate anyway. Um, and I know ourselves, we're looking at more and more towards that inclusive gaming experience that people can have through gaming, you know, and it's not just playing the game, it's how we share you know, and every aspect of it, of bringing people together from around the globe within, you know, one community. And sure, we've seen many games do this in AAA for the last few years. You know, I've been playing Sea of Thieves a lot in lockdown. You know, my son's been playing a lot of Fortnite um, and the communities around them. But this is an area now that indie developers have really got to start to embrace. Right. Um, and, you know, just given your your history with the industry, um, your story, what advice would you give for the, the you know young Debbie Bestwicks out there right now who are looking to forge their own path in games, whether it is as a developer or as a publisher um, and sort of industry professional? You you have just such a great story, having gone through sort of the the ranks and really you know being a badass in the games industry. And uh, uh, so many folks are inspired by you and your story. What, what would you tell them, uh, you know, how can they get to where you are 30 years from now? Yeah, I think a general question, don't give up, you know, um, work hard, don't forget, I joined the industry in the mid eighties. Um, I could count on, you know, one hand, the number of females that were actually in the gaming industry at that time globally, very few of us. Um, you know, and so I always think, you know, for women in particular, you know, um, we need confidence sometimes. It took me a long time to get confident in my own skin um, and to believe in my own abilities. Honestly, just believe in yourself. Do not give up. But don't think this comes easy. This is hard work. You will work incredibly hard, but the results are there. And I am a great example of where you can get to. I started right at the bottom. I came from nowhere you know, and just worked incredibly hard um, for, you know, I mean, Team 17 is 30 years this year. I've been in the games industry for coming up to 35 years this year. And I would honestly say at every single stage, it's been hard work and just looking at the bigger picture and the potential of where you want to go and stay focused on that journey. I think that's the perfect place for us to wrap up, Debbie. Thank you so so much for joining us uh here at play nyc um really really happy to have you here with us uh and excited for folks to see you know what you're all about and, and learn a little bit more about you because i think a lot of folks know you know team 17's awesome pantheon of games but uh getting to know the people behind those games is so so important to us so thanks so much for giving us a glimpse into your story your perspective today and uh and and thanks again Lovely. And same, thank you so much and really good luck with the event. Awesome. Amazing. All right. Okay.